All right, y'all, Caroline here from Chalkbeat. Um, we're gonna go ahead and get started because we have a full hour together. We're so excited you're here. Um, a few housekeeping notes from me. Uh, please use the Q&A box as a place to submit audience questions. We're gonna have a time for that at the end. Um, so we'd love to hear from you what you're curious about. Um, we've got an amazing panel of students and community members. So please use the Q&A. Uh, we'd love to hear from you. For all other things, you can use the chat. If you um, want to say something encouraging after you know someone said something you agree with, or um, if you have a technical issue, please use the chat. We'll be watching that and we'll make sure to respond. Um, Susan, my colleague on the engagement team, will also be helping me out. So she might pop in. This is going to be recorded and published on our YouTube page afterward. Uh, so if you know of anyone who would want to listen to this conversation, we'll send out a link for you to do so. Um, so thank you so much for being here. I'm going to turn it over to my colleague, Lee, who's going to kick us off. Well, um, good afternoon, everyone, and thank you for joining us. Uh, my name is Lee Wack. I am Development Director for Chalkbeat Newark, uh, which basically means I, I build relationships and, and work with those uh, who uh, support us so that we can do the great journalism we do and do great events like this. So with that in mind, I want to thank Prudential. Uh, Prudential is um, clearly a, a great and known uh, company within Newark, and we're going to hear from Tiffany Jackson a, a little bit later. Uh, but really, for Chalkbeat, we're a nonprofit news organization. So without our sponsors, funders, donors, and members, uh, we're not able to do this, uh, this great work. And so we're very thankful for that partnership and the partnership of others who support us in Newark. Um, Really quickly, my last job was being spokesman for the Philadelphia Public Schools, and my favorite thing to do was to highlight students so that they could speak and tell their own story, um, because they're the, one that's, the ones that are experiencing the education system. Like, we should always listen to students. So I'm very excited about today's conversation. Um, Chalkbeat Newark has been up and running for two years, and we're, uh, we've been doing events like this, obviously, events in person back in the day when you could do that. Um, but you know we're all getting used to this visual, uh, this visual and virtual uh, format, and so we're glad that so many of you have joined us today. Um, and so um, it's exciting to spot to spotlight our community and spotlight again our students. Um, and this is um, this event today is kind of a, a capstone capstone for our Ready or Not series. Um, what is Ready or Not series for those that don't know? Um, I could give a lot of answers, but basically. It's about are students ready for college and are the colleges ready for the students? Um, and it couldn't be a more important time to discuss this because obviously there's so much going on in our community. We have at least two pandemics, obviously the coronavirus, but also um, unjust killings of black and brown uh, people across the country and systemic racism and, and grappling with that. So there's so much to talk about. And so with, without, um, you know, there's so much to talk about and it's so much it's so core to who we are as Chalkbeat. Um, so uh, I, now it's my pleasure to introduce Patrick Wall, our senior reporter for Chalkbeat Newark. Very importantly, it's those that you don't know, Patrick started his career as a fourth grade teacher, um, but he's also had a great career in journalism and is a great reporter for us here uh, in, in Newark um, and has, you know, won several awards and, and done, done a lot of great important series like this one uh, the Ready or Not series. So uh, with that, Patrick, uh, take us away. And I'm very thankful we're having this conversation today. Thank you so much, Lee. And thank you, everybody, for joining us today and the wonderful panelists who I'm going to introduce in just a moment uh, for, for participating. So I'm, I'm going to say a few words about the topic of this event that Lee mentioned. Um, this is the capstone of the series that we've been working on called Ready or Not. And the focus is really on our students, and I focus in particular Newark, are Newark students ready for college and are colleges ready to help them graduate? And so I think everyone here who's on the panel and everyone watching at home knows how important college is, knows that um, college graduates earn more, they are less likely to live in poverty, they're even more likely um, to live longer in their lives. But we also know that enrolling in college is not the same as graduating and that getting students all the way to uh, across the finish line to a degree can be a huge hurdle. And in Newark, actually more than half of students who enroll in college right after high school do not end, um, end up getting a degree within six years. 
So that's a huge group of students who start college, don't make it to the finish line and, and may end up with debt and a harder time getting a good paying job. And so we've been looking at uh, what are some of the, the causes of that. And one of the key pieces of this puzzle is the first year of college. This is a time when students really can set up the foundation for success. You develop a sense of belonging. Um, you start to get some of the academic habits and the support you need to get on the right path in college, or you don't. And a lot of times that falls onto students, but as we know, universities and colleges play a huge role in making sure students get off to that good start. And so that, that is what we've been looking at and what we want to talk about today. But of course, this is not just normal times when freshman year would already be a roller coaster for a lot of students. This year, the pandemic has turned college upside down. So we know that um, a lot of campuses are going to be either closed or are going to be operating very differently from normal. A lot of students will either be staying home or at least taking a lot of their classes online. And so this is going to be a year like no other. It's going to present new challenges, but hopefully some new opportunities as well. And so that is what we want to talk about today with our amazing group of students here. And so we have five outstanding students. Three of them have already completed their first year of college and two are about to start. And we also have Ms. Wilhelmina Holder, who if you have interacted with schools and public education in Newark any time over the last many, many years, you've probably come across Ms. Holder at some point. Uh, she's a longtime parent advocate and activist for public education. And she also co-directs the high school academic support program which specifically helps prepare New York high school students for college. So I'm gonna have each of those panelists um, say a few words to introduce themselves, but I also just wanna quickly ask the audience um, at home, if you, you're gonna see a poll, I hope it popped up in your screen right now. It's gonna ask you how you identify, whether as a student, an educator, a parent, an administrator, or other, that will just give us a sense of who is joining us today and kind of what your connection is to these issues. So you can take that now and uh, we'll share those results in just a moment. And um, as you're doing that, I'm gonna get started with the students here. And so students, can we go ahead and I want you to say, if you don't mind, your name, your university or college where you're headed to, what or where you are now, what year you're in, and also how you're feeling as you're about to start this school year in the middle of a pandemic. Um, and so let's start, I'm just gonna go on the order in my screen here, if that's okay. Um, and before I call on the first student, just so we, so you can see the uh, results of our audience poll, about a quarter of the people here today are educators, about 17% are students, 6% are parents, 4% administrators, and then half are others, which could be community members, all kinds of other folks. Um, people who study these issues and work in them. And so we're happy to have all of you here. So I'm, like I said, I'm gonna go across the screen, um, get us started. So Camille, do you mind starting college year and how you're feeling as you're getting ready for this school year? All right, um, well, hi everybody, my name is Camille. Uh, Camille Vickers, I'm from Newark, New Jersey. I'm a graduate of Newark Collegiate Academy. Uh, it's a KIPP charter school. I'm a currently a rising sophomore at Villanova University. Um, going into this sophomore year, sort of after going through a pandemic, I would say worry is definitely at the front of my mind. Um, I do move in next Sunday, so August 16th, I will be moving back into campus. And just knowing uh, that everything's gonna be different, we are taking classes in person, um, but still knowing that there are things online, but still knowing that there is a pandemic awaiting you when you get back to campus. Um, so I'd say worried is just one of the few many feelings that I have inside me at the moment. Thank you. Okay. Zanaya, can you go? Hi, I am Zanaya Jacobs Wright. I am a graduate of Arts High School in North New Jersey. I was a vocal major. Now I am a rising sophomore at Rutgers University, Newark. And I, I know some of the things that I'm kind of worried about are the stability of the classroom environment on like either some of some that are gonna be in the classroom and some that are gonna be online is it gonna be the same is the environment gonna be 
as that different from last semester? Are we going to be able to help each other as much as we were in our freshman year? And are we going to be able to succeed in a better way or e even just as much as last um, uh, as first semester this past year? Is it going to affect my education? Thank you, Zion. Those are all huge questions that hopefully we'll get to today. Rashid, can you go? Hey, everyone. My name is Rashid Adeole. Uh, I am a rising senior at Franklin and Marshall College, uh, located in Lancaster, Pennsylvania. Um, and I graduated from Mary P. Thomas Charter High School. But before that, I went to St. Benedict's Prep for my freshman year in high school. And as far as uh, fall, I am feeling pretty confident, um, you know, even in the face of uh, uncertainty, uh, because as a senior, I have, I have the privilege of having my own place off campus. Um, so right now, my school is, has decided to reopen using a hybrid plan, meaning some classes will be remote, some will be in person. Um, if it decides to go fully remote, um, then I wouldn't Feel, I wouldn't be shocked because I still have my own place off campus um, that I can uh, always go back to and take my classes from there. Um, but I certainly am uh, a bit uh, pessimistic about the social scene because it's my, it's my final year and I was hoping to uh, make uh, memories and make the best of it with my senior friends before we all go out into the world. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, and now our two incoming college students. Melanie, can you introduce yourself? Hello, everybody. My name is Melanie Gonzalez. I recently graduated from Beringer High School as a valedictorian, and I'm going to be a freshman in the fall in Villanova University. So, yeah. <laughs> and do you wanna say a word about how you're feeling getting ready to start college at this moment? Mm -hmm. Well, yeah, I actually have to move in the 11th, and I'm really excited about it. I know that there's going to be major changes in the dynamics um, in Villanova because of the pandemic, but I'm still very grateful because I get to live in campus, and I was really nervous about the whole just beginning of college with this pandemic, and I didn't want it to be super different than what I expected. And I know it's going to be different, but I'm still very excited and thankful. Thank you. Okay, and Devon. Hi, everybody. My name is Devon Christopher Corey. Um, I'll be. I'm a rising freshman at Rutgers Newark, Rutgers University Newark, and which was located downtown Newark, New Jersey. Um, I graduated number two at University High School, um, and I was number nine in the district. Um, journal. I'm going in as a journalism major and a social justice minor. And the way I'm feeling right now, I'm very intrigued about the whole, you know, moving on campus thing because I will be moving in very soon. I haven't gotten a date yet, but very intrigued because this is a totally different experience. I don't want to be too pessimistic or too optimistic. I want to be, you know, realistic right now. I just want to feel like, you know, I want to feel at ease with this whole situation right now. Thank you, Devon. And you're one of the small number of students who are going to be moving on campus at, at Rutgers Newark because I know most are, they're, they're going to limit how many are coming onto campus this yeah it's up to 30 percent yeah only 30 percent are allowed to live on campus got it okay all right and miss holder can you just say a few words about the work that you do with newark students who are in high school who are getting ready for college just a little bit about kind of what you do to help prepare students and grandmother of six and oh let me just and now I have actually my two oldest grandchildren in a couple of years will be hitting the grounds at Stanford. They're Stanford bound and someone wants to go somewhere else, but we'll be doing that. But over the last 25 years now, um, Lyndon Brown, through our program, High School Academic Support Program, we have ushered in and through college 5,000 students from Newark, from Charter, mainly the public district and some from private, St. Benedict's, the private schools, and um, what we have found is that college readiness and career readiness really begins from birth. It does not begin in high school. 
It begins at home and it begins, and it needs to be a communal conversation with the community at church, at the grocery store, wherever you go, because they have, there's an African proverb that I strongly believe in. They ask you, not how you're doing. When they want to measure the wellness of a community, they ask how are the children doing. And I think we need to use that as a model to focus our entity to support students. So over the years, we have supported students with essay writing, SAT prep, college tours, college fairs, um, internships, getting them scholarships. I wrote the scholarship guys, um, stop leaving money on the table. And the district, uh, I have to update it, it was on the district website, the schools used it um, last year and the year before. So it has to be updated now. And I also wrote a guide on uh, colleges for students with special needs. So the point is there's a role for everybody to play in this equation to get our children access to higher education, whether they go into military service or they go into a technical or trade school, they go to a community college or four year college. The point is to make sure they're successful, no matter what that looks like for them, that they have the skills and the tools they need so they can succeed. And right now we're not in that space, but I believe in the potential of that space of things happening now. And the group, I'm so proud of the group that is um, the students um, that's on this panel because they are a privileged few, because most of the students do not mirror and reflect what's here today. So we need to figure out how to support the other students, their peers that they graduated with, and um, even the ones who were in college with them who will no longer be returning to campus for whatever reason. So we need to figure that out, the social emotional, the stressors that's causing the dropouts, the social emotional needs that's not being met while they're in high school and even younger, so that they can be prepared and happy in life. And I think, like I said, I wanna charge the entire community to get involved, the parents, the pastors, the churches, the nonprofits, um, everybody, the city, the elected officials. We need to have a successive and concrete roadmap that says we're gonna support these children and we need to look at the stresses and see what's causing them not to succeed because they're more than capable. I believe in our, the genius of our children of color. And um, they ne that needs to be cultivated and nurtured. Thank you so much, Ms. Holder. And so many critical points there. I think your, your point about the community is so important that this, this really does take the schools, but also people in the community groups like yours and the colleges and universities themselves um, supporting students. So, um, I want to, first of all, just remind the audience, and I think you'll see this in the chat too, that you can um, submit questions that we'll get to in a little bit. And I also want to uh, start a question for everyone here. It's another audience engagement question. And this is, which, so we're gonna think about college success, which of these barriers preventing students from graduating college do you think deserves more attention and resources? And these are some of the options that we have heard from students and, and I've seen in my reporting. Struggles in figuring out how to pay for college, lack of academic preparation or support, not having someone to navigate college with you, lack of social and emotional support, and food insecurity and lack of resources, which could include housing, laptops, other things like that that are essential for, for getting through college. So if you just take a moment and submit what you think is is a barrier that needs more attention and then we will share the results and as as you guys are finishing that off i want to start asking the students about this moment so we know that college this year is not going to be like any other and some of the students who are already in college have kind of gotten a preview of this in the spring so you were in the middle of, of going to college and then all of a sudden things completely changed and so i want to ask you about that really quickly let me share the result of the poll that we just did so 17 percent of folks say that struggling with finances should get more attention um let's see eight percent say academic preparation needs more the largest group of people here said 31 percent say that not having someone to navigate college with you is the biggest barrier and then 22% say lack of social emotional support and 22% food insecurity and lack of resources. So that will be great to keep in mind. Um, so Camille, can you start by telling us you're in college this spring, the pandemic hits, what was that like for you? 
So that moment for me, um, I would say it just, it was really eye-opening. Um, I don't know, I feel like sort of after that moment, a lot changed just for me, but I feel like the changes are like progressing to the adult I'm gonna become. Um, sort of at Villanova, we had spring break, we came back and the week after our spring break was the same week we got sent home. Um, so there were like whispers on campus, uh, oh, the coronavirus, of course, you know, it's coming, uh, it's possible we may get sent home. Uh, and then Friday evening, we got our email, and we were asked to be off of campus by Sunday officially, um, which is the one thing I did appreciate. They tried to give students at least a 48 hour notice. A lot of schools didn't have that. So to have that cushion, um, I would say was good. Um, for me, I wasn't too worried about the transition um, until uh, right before we got sent home, actually like the day before my laptop broke. I dropped it off at the Apple store. I was told it'd be maybe like three days take to fix. Um, that same week in the Apple store got quarantined. So my laptop was there throughout the entire time we had the virtual platform. Um, so I would say that adjustment, um, all of my classes were, were writing intensive. So writing 10 page papers off of my phone, trying to switch to an iPad. It's just one already, you have to find a new learning environment because you're no longer going to a library. You're no longer studying with friends late at night. You're no longer doing those things, but now transitioning to typing on a phone and making appointments from different forms of contact. So just sort of trying to get used to that adjustment really did. It was very a humbling experience. Um, it was definitely, it put a sour into freshman year. Um, but I think overall, just being able to get through it and make sure that um, I ended the year off strong, that's really all I was focusing on. Um, because I think even though we weren't in the classroom, I still wanted to take advantage of meeting with my classmates, having the opportunity to talk to my professors. So I didn't let it stop my education. I think it just sort of changed what education meant to me at that moment. Got it, okay. Um, so I had, can you talk about what it was like for you? Um, and specifically, I know that a lot of your classes, uh, they had been, the classes that had met in person all of a sudden were not meeting in person, but they also weren't really meeting online for some of them. It was mostly just posting assignments. Well, how did that change your college experience? Yeah. It change things a lot because I had at the most two classes that we had like actual video chats weekly. One of them we met twice a week because it was a class where we had to read together and discuss what's going on in order to pass a test. And that was like the class that I did the best in because I work better when I can see my professor face to face and talk to them and ask questions so that I know that I'm understanding it so I don't walk away thinking I get it and then I get a test or a paper in front of me and I'm like what the heck is going on so with dealing with the classes where it was just like okay here's your assignment and I haven't talked to those professors since everything closed down those are the classes where I was like okay I have to work extra hard in order to pass this class so my grades second semester compared to my grades first semester were not on the same wavelength. Like I did well enough to keep my GPA in the safest place possible for, for me, like as long, I feel like as long as I'm above like a 3.2, I'm okay. So as long as I was able to keep my cumulative GPA there, I was going to be fine. But the stress of, not having full access to the things that I had while I was living on campus. I, I had to borrow a laptop from my university because my laptop also broke like right before everything happened. Wow, uh, okay, thank you. Uh, Devon, so you are getting ready to start freshman year, but you've actually been in a summer prep program at Rutgers Newark that you're just about to finish up. Can you say a little bit about what that experience was like and, and something that was new this year because of the pandemic, it was all online. So how did that kind of get you set up for college and also kind of get you prepared for what it's gonna look like this fall? Um, it 
it it really made me used to the idea of it. Um, I think when you go into, you know, I mean, obviously I was, it was the same way during high school during my last quarter, but you know, when you go into college it's very different, you know, you don't really have, I, I think a lot of the professors are in a position where they feel like we're all going through something. So they feel like nobody's really getting cut any slack here. So um, nobody's better than anybody else. So I feel like this program is really it, it was very realistic you know and i feel like when it com went for a freshman year even though i will be dorming but you know learning remotely it still shows that you know you're still in a position where a, a lot of things can change and you know who knows what can happen next and where it's you you're never really too sure about what can happen you know so i feel like it did prepare me in the sense of the work but as far as what will happen next it's kind of like i'm still at unease here so yeah absolutely it, it seems like that's going to be a common theme it's just kind of a lot of uncertainty about the fall Melanie, can you tell us a little bit, you are going to be heading to Villanova, which unlike some universities is reopening campus and bringing students back on. You're going to, I know that students will have to be tested and quarantined for a bit before you come, but can you tell us how you're feeling heading back to, or actually moving to a campus for the first time, but at this moment during the pandemic? Yeah, well, um, like Devon said, you can be prepared for college, but this is a completely new process for everybody. So there's nobody who can really tell you about how to deal with this. So I've attended multiple college preparatory programs like NJ seats or upward bound programs, etc. cetera. But um, this, is, this is different. So nobody know nobody knew that this was going to happen. So I'm still really excited because even though Villanova was my first option because of, first of all, because of the great academic program they have, but also because of the, just all the sporting events and just all that community, it just, it felt like my place. So I know it's going to be different and I'm still, I'm still very excited about moving in. But yeah, I, I know it will be made, there will be major changes, but I'm, I'm still happy that, like I said, I'm still happy that I get to live on campus. So yeah. Thank you, okay. All right, now I wanna ask about support for students. So we know that that's critical for student success at, at any time but it, I feel like it's gonna be especially important at this moment when like we've heard from students, there's just a lot of uncertainty, a lot of unanswered questions. And so Rashid, can you tell us about, if you think back over and you're a senior, so you have had um, more college experience than the other students here. When you look back on your time in college, was there a particular program or a person who helped you guide, um, who helped guide you through uh, any challenging times, and in particular that really critical first year, uh, and and if there was, you know, was there something that they did or said that was especially helpful for you? Oh well, that's a really good question I have to say, um, and you know, I, I'm sure the sophomores on the panel uh, probably agree to this. Your first year um, is always uh, a very uh, tedious and confusing. Uh, probably the most confusing year of your college experience because, you know, there's just so many surprises. You didn't know what you, well, what you expect uh, turns out to be, you know, what's not the case. Um, and as far as how I was able to do uh, really well my freshman year and, you know, going on to make Dean's List, uh, I, I like to give a lot of that credit back to my professors. Um, and, you know, it's, it's, it's very, very underrated. Um, and I know it's highly encouraged, but, you know, underrated because students, uh, some students still don't take advantage of it, but building relationships with your professor um, is probably one of the uh, the biggest uh, advantage you can give yourself, right? Because these are the people who are giving you the assignment. Um, and so when you go up to them and ask for uh, more clarification, um, the assignments, you know, becomes easier. And sometimes, you know, they kind of guide you through it, um, especially if they, 
if you have a, you know, a personal connection with them and they understand your situation and say, oh, you know, this is someone who went to a high school that didn't necessarily prepare them for Franklin and Marshall, which is a very uh, rigorous school. Um, so, you know, why don't we continue to touch points and et cetera. So I think for me, definitely, definitely building professors, uh, build a relationship with my professors, uh, but I didn't know to build a relationship with my professors. Um, you know, I, I, at least I didn't know it on my own, but I was a part of a law program called NJ Leap, uh, which stands for New Jersey Law Education and Empowerment Project. Um, and there's a college support system in place. Um, and they, the, the, point, the point of contact usually gets in, got in touch with me and say, hey, Rashid, let's talk. Uh, have you explored these different avenues? And I said, well, that I have some of, most of them I have not. Um, but it wasn't until I started taking uh, their advice and saying, oh, you should go to office hours. And I was able to also man realize uh, the benefits um, of, you know, having a really good relationship with your professors. And as I'm walking out the door, you know, that support, you know, hasn't, you know, decreased. In fact, it's gotten, it's going up exponentially because now my professors are helping me look for jobs um, and are hoping that one day I'd come back and uh, be a, a contributing member of the college as well, and also mentoring uh, other students in their course. So yeah, definitely, definitely build a relationship with your professor is, is, uh, is a uh, great advantage that you can give yourself in college, even during these times as well. That is awesome. And it sounds like you did two super important things. Like one, you were part of a group that provided kind of some guidance, and then you took their advice. And then also, you really actively sought out those relationships with professors and people on campus, which I know is huge. Um, either Camille or Zanaya, do you want to talk about in your first year, which you just completed, if there was a particular program or a person that was especially helpful for you? I'll go. Mm -hmm. uh, well, I am a Rutgers Sutra Scholar and an EOF Scholar. And in high school, I was a National Honor, I was a National Honor Society. So I've, I've had like the preparation for college but as he said there are some things that you don't expect there are differences in college prep and actual actually being in college and like being in it and experience, experiencing it and I totally agree with him when it comes to building relationships with professors uh, I am the type of person where I've, I've always been the person like I want my teachers and my professors and my TAs to know my name and for good reasons. I want them to know that I'm the type of person to volunteer to give an answer or pass my work in before time or in certain things like that. I, my in my uh, sociology class first semester, it got to a point where my professor was like, okay, Zanaya, let someone else answer a question. And it's like, okay, <laughs> wait, okay. Can this person answer the question? Wait, what's your name again? So it's like, I like I want it to be noticed for the positivity that I bring to a classroom setting and that also helps when it comes to your grades because if they know that maybe you struggled on a certain theme they'll like make give you a little bit of leeway or help you out a little extra with uh after hours after classes and things like that but I also think that freshman year is the year you find your people and not just socially, but academically, when you're in a classroom and you see that, okay, someone sitting next to you might not understand something and you might not understand something else, you can help each other. You find your study groups for each of your classes. And if you happen to have a class with a friend, just make sure that friend is someone that you can sit down with and actually study with and not distract you. If you know that your friends are in the same class, you're gonna get distracted, sit on the other side of the room. That's great. Okay. Uh, yeah. I just wanted to really build up quickly on what Zanaya just said in terms of like class participation. Um, so for anyone who's been in a college class setting, um, you understand that a lot of college students actually don't participate in class, you know, for many reasons. Uh, and that's something that I'm extremely perplexed by. You know, I still am. Uh, but participating in class, like Zanaya said, is, uh, is a great way to distinguish and set yourself apart. Um, and also making sure that you're understanding material by being able to regurgitate what's being said to you back to the professor. So definitely, definitely class participation. Uh, I know it's not highly uh, encouraged uh, in college, at least in an, on a social setting, uh, but it's something that as an individual um, can uh, take you really far. Yeah. Great, thank you. 
Camille, do you want to um, just say a few words about your, so you are a graduate of KIPP, which has a program specifically for graduates where it pairs them with a mentor throughout college. Um, so that's specific to KIPP, but there are other schools that do similar things. Newark Public Schools is, is hoping to add a mentor program like that. And then programs like EOF that Devon and Zania are part of also have counselors and advisors that are assigned to them. So can you just talk about that advisor mentor relationship and how that's been helpful? Yeah, sure, definitely. So KIPP does have a program. Uh, it's called KIPP Through College. And essentially it's like they'll give you uh, the support they gave you applying for schools, finding schools, everything you had in college. They try to mirror that for what life looks like after high school. Um, so they have done a really great job, I would say, um, of giving me that support. Uh, my counselor's name is Mr. Chavis, um, and he's always sort of been um, anything I needed. Uh, he's been able to sort of help me out. Um, through that program, I was able to find placement for a remote summer internship uh, for a DC office this year with the National Alliance for Public Charter Schools. Um, I think that's just one example of KIPP always sort of giving that extra, like going the extra mile for their students. Um, like with internships, I think finding placement after your freshman year can be like a big struggle. And even just letting them know, hey, like this is something I'm interested in, I'm considering this career field. And they were able to help me find that placement. I think that's just one thing that I took advantage of. Um, but even at Villanova, uh, there's a similar program sort of set up for students who choose to opt into it. It's called CASA, uh, the Center for Access, Success and Achievement. Uh, I am a CASA student, so I do get a second advisor at Villanova uh, outside of my academic advisor, and they do the same thing. Um, it sort of mirrors what Zanaya and Rashi were both saying, go out and make those connections because um, your advisor, similar to your professors, can bring you opportunities. They can put you in rooms with people. They can like send you out, send your resume out. So I think just building those relationships, highlighting on those things and always remembering to ask like anything that you don't really know um, definitely shaped my experience and it can definitely help anybody coming through those experiences. That is great, thank you. Ms. Holder, you have worked with countless high school students over the years and current college students. Can you tell us a little bit about, in, in your experience, what are the areas uh, that Newark students in particular you have found are well prepared for college and they're bringing a lot of strengths uh, when, with them when they go? And where are the areas where you see more gaps in their readiness, where they seem less prepared? And make sure, can you unmute? There we go. Just did it again. Okay, hi everyone. This is across the board though, and it's not just the um, Newark Public Schools, it's also the charters because um, a lot of the students that I've worked with, St. Benedict's, Marion P. Thomas, all the charter schools, there's not one that we haven't had students from and private schools, ch children who live in Newark and also attend private schools outside of Newark. But there are some issues that still arise and that is the lack of um, readiness for them emotionally. I don't think the students get the emotional support they need prior to leaving um, for college. I think that's an area where we all can increase the support from them. I just got a statistic from the college board that 60% of students, first year students, first generation first year students indicated they wish they got more emotional support while they were in high school before they left to go to college. And that statistic was alarming to me. It stuck out and I said, we have to do something there. The students are strong advocates. And I, I, I do say that because that's the one piece we build into our program, advocacy, the, the, the point, and we actually, are, we play the roles, we're interactive, of how do you approach a college professor? When do you approach? What do you say? What do you do? You don't wait until you get in trouble. You go after the first or second class, introduce yourself, talk about your goals, your careers, et cetera. You connect. So that professor might be the one that recommend you for a job, an internship, a summer research uh, that pays well to those research uh, positions pay well. So you need mentors, you need assistance on college as well as in high school. Now, Newark Public Schools, Thankfully, we have Roger Leon, Superintendent Roger Leon, who is now putting in place those kind of things. I mean, they were there loosely, depending on the school you went to and the person you interacted with, but now it's gonna be systemic so that children will have the opportunity to connect while they're at high school before they leave to go to college or, in, or pursue their post-secondary attainment, whatever their goals are. So the, the strengths are that um, our children are capable and they're advocates. They just need a little guidance and, and some mentorship to show them so that they're anchored before they get on that campus. And the other issue is, of course, it's the issue that has been systemic in all of these schools. 
And that is when I look at the quality of writing, our children are not quite there um, in terms of looking at their research papers, looking at their homework assignments, looking at their writing capabilities. It's not that they can't do it. I suspect it's because they need to read more. And they're not giving the type of reading assignments that would empower them so that they could, because if you can't become a proficient writer unless you're a proficient reader. And I think that needs to be, that thread needs to start in kindergarten all the way through so that they're not afraid to write a 25 page term paper. Right. You know, and, and, that, that gets to also the, the rigor of, of classes. And we know that in terms of access to advanced placement classes, that's something that, that high schools are working on, but there are still a lot of students that, that don't have access or aren't enrolled in those classes. That that's exactly right, Patrick. But that too, because Newark Public Schools was under state domination for 25 years, I went to Newark Public High School, Week Wake High, we were number one in the country. And I left there as a German scholar. And I had AP biology, I had AP German, I had AP history. So the point is, how did we get to where we are? It's because we were denied opportunities. Not that the children can't do it, because I came out of a very humble background on yes. 17th Avenue in the projects. And my brothers and sisters, we all went to college, all six of us. And what I'm saying, now my grandchildren, thank God my, my children working on their PhDs, their master's degree, et cetera. But what I'm saying is that we still have to have that support for the children before they leave high school. And it yeah. really should start, as I said, college preparation starts holistically when they're born. But in the eighth grade, we need to be targeting the tools, the study skills. Children don't even know how to read informational texts. Yes. And the All study right. skills need to be strengthened. And that's the note taking, the study skills. These are the things that get them through school. And, and the mentorship is very important indeed. Yes. But these are the tools that they can use before they leave high school so that they can go on to uh, great schools. And yes. believe me, any school that you go to and graduate from is a great school. So I don't give any more honor if you went to Harvard and you graduate from Texas County College. When you go to a college and you graduate, that's a great achievement. Thank you, Ms. Holder. Okay, I want to quickly shift um, to a different question, but and also to let the audience know that um, if you haven't submitted a question, you can do that. We, we already got some great ones that we will turn to in just a moment here. Um, before I do that, I just wanna ask one other question um, that I have been wondering for the students is, and it relates to this moment we're in. So we are clearly not only in the middle of the coronavirus pandemic, but we also are dealing with the fight for racial justice. And this has gotten new urgency with the police killing of George Floyd, the movement for black lives. And we know that um, colleges and universities are a very important part of this and um, a real site of change or of perpetuating the inequality and the injustice that we see. And so, um, I would love to hear every student that we're going to have to keep it short because of um, we want to get to audience questions. So can I ask one of the current students, so Camille, Zania, or Rashid, if you um, could change one thing at your college to promote racial justice, something that the university could do to help black and brown students succeed and to make sure that they are treated fairly and equi equitably on campus, what is one thing that you would change? I would change the fact, okay, like, my school is very diverse. I go to Rutgers University, Newark. We're one of the most diverse colleges in the country. Um, and uh, we're a big melting pot, but I feel like we're not aware of each other as much as we should be. Like, we should be aware of our Blackness and that when we step outside of this university, we're not going to be treated the same way we're treated within this university. When we get into the work field, we are not going to have the, I want to say, the stepping stone that some other people who come from other places or who look differently are going to have. We're definitely going to have a struggle, and I wish that we talk more about that and get a better understanding, especially for us, the younger students, because there are certain organizations where it's like, okay, yeah, you're black, you're proud, and we're gonna help you afterwards. But 
I feel like it needs to be on a larger spectrum. That's great. Thank you. And for um, one of the students at either um, Villanova or Franklin and Marshall, these are predominantly white institutions. Can you just say a few words about what, what it's like in that setting in terms of how the university is promoting racial justice or not there and kind of what it's like as a person of color to navigate that? Um, I would say for me at Villanova, um, I think like they're, they're trying, I would say at this point, because things are coming to the head and students are starting to speak up, uh, the university is sort of being forced to go ahead and make that change. Um, I think similar to what Zanai was saying, um, one thing that I think happens too often at any college or any, any university is uh, there's this thing about like tokenizing the black student, uh, the black awarding over Stelling, either if they're in sports or they're doing really good academically or they're really good in whatever they're doing well at, the university tokenizes them and puts that person at the face of the university. And I think too often that creates like a split within the minority community on campus. And you're not able to get in touch with your black with you with your blackness. You're not able to get in touch with your own identity because you I feel like you become enwrapped in sort of promoting the university rather than being there just for your education. And it's too much of a divide within the community to actually come together. Um, at Villanova, currently only five percent of our students identify as African American. So coming from that small five percent, now us being taken apart, it is a crippling feeling and it makes students feel like they can't possibly be alone during their years there. Thank you. Yeah, I mean, just to kind of build off on what Camille said, I think uh, a school like Franklin and Marshall, which is only a few hours away from uh, Villanova is also trying. I mean, recently we've had some racial incidents, um, you know, and it's on the news. Uh, and, I, and I think the school's response and also the, what it took for the school to respond um, obviously something that needs to be uh, reflected upon. So there was a huge protest on campus where that also was on the news as well. And until the school, until Franklin and Marshall finally responded uh, to the uh, concerns of its uh, 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 minority students. And like Camille said, there's this tokenism of, uh, of minority students on at PWIs. And I think that is kind of like a false charity uh, uh, to the, from the, uh, institutions who feel as though they're giving financial aid to the students and you know that's more than enough uh, but you know that's just kind of like a piece of the puzzle right when students come into the door um, they, they're, they, they're faced with a lot of obstacles and surprises because one they don't have uh, parents who've been to college or parents who can just pay uh, for them to get every single thing in college um, like most of the students here at Franklin and Marshall who come from you know extremely privileged background uh, I saw I think I saw in the survey 31% of the people saying that uh, the reason why students don't do so well in college is because they don't have someone to navigate uh, that space uh, for them. Um, and I think uh, a school like Franklin Marshall and Villanova has to understand that as minority students uh, don't come in uh, with, you know, uh, uh, the silver spoon or, uh, you know, a dad or mom who's went to college who can guide them. So the college seriously needs to step up um, in uh, addressing the inequity that currently uh, uh, exist on their um, college campuses today. And also shouldn't wait until student protests. I think they should be proactive um, uh, rather than reactive uh, when it comes to social justice as well. Thank you so, so much, Rashid. Um, and that I would is- I to add on to yeah. what Camille was saying yeah. about Villanova because it was definitely one of the things that I had to consider when applying to, to Nova as a Hispanic female here. So. If, I think most people find it discouraging, but it isn't to me because I'm happy that, I mean, I know that there's things that have to change, but I'm happy that I get to be part of that process. I'm happy that I'm part of the reason why that is going to change in Villanova, like as a Hispanic female, like I said, entering a PWI. I feel very happy to be part of that movement too. So, yeah. Thank you so much. Um, and. I, I wanted that is, you guys all have such great thoughts on that. I want to make sure that we get to a few of the audience questions. So Devon, can you start with one that we got, um, which is for current students. Um, and so you would, this is for uh, the summer program that you were in or the spring. How did you focus in your online classes if you're working from home? Like how do you just logistically make that work for you? 
So what I will say is do not set yourself up and have your computer in the bed with you. You will go to sleep. I'm telling you, that is a huge setup. You and you think, I'm going to take a nap for five minutes. They're going over a lesson that I already know about already. And then you wake up and it says the chat has ended. And it's like, wow. So put yourself in a position, put yourself in a space where you have to get out the bed, where you have to do what you would usually do if you are still going to school. Take a shower, brush your teeth, eat, put just like, I'm in a position right now, like, I'm in my laundry room right now. Like, I kind of have a laundry computer room kind of thing going on. But, um, you really have to put yourself in a position where you know you're gonna focus, where you're forced to be in front of the camera. Turn your camera on so you can st stay away. Cause if you turn your camera off, you're really going to set yourself up to do other things, you know? It's like almost sitting in front of the class, you know? You know that you're not gonna fall asleep if you sit in front of the class, sit at the front of the class if this was an in-person experience. So that's why I say turn your camera on. Yeah, it's like really take notes. Like the class will go by so much faster if you're just looking here like this. It's gonna be like mm, okay. That's so quick. yeah. <laughs> so yeah, that's how I focus. And to be honest, my um my last spring, my, like that last quarter and a half that I had during my school year um in high school, that was like one of my best you know cycles I've ever had. Um, I finished. What, I usually always had all A's but I finished with all A pluses. So um, I finished high school with like a 4.4 and I finished that quarter with a 4.607. So yeah, it was it was a good experience. Yeah. It that was is good. amazing. And that's such a great point about, even if you're in your laundry room, treating it like a classroom, that's really gonna help you. <laughs> um, all right, we, we have another audience question. Um, for the current college students, but um, I would say for, and coming soon, so Melanie, if you if you have thoughts on this too, but what supports material, socio emotional habits or mentoring have been most helpful in closing out the the year strongly? So, what supports that you got were most helpful in closing out the school year strongly? Does anyone want to weigh in? Yep. Um, well, definitely, just knowing that my teachers were very understanding with me, they would text me and ask me, how are you doing? Is there anything you need like in regarding anything like food or things at home? Just knowing that they care about you, not only for your academic development, but also for you like as a person. That was really, I, I found it like a really, re I found it really comforting to have that kind of support and understanding from them, but also from the people of the programs that I've attended. Like I mentioned, NJC, it's an upper bound program. They've also been there, like not only academically, but also for me, like that they provided me also with that emotional support. And I think that was very important in my development. Thank you. And Zanaya, I want to go to you, but I want to, um, to have you answer this this final question from the audience here and um the the person says first of all thank you for this discussion huge thank you to the students for their honesty and all the information they're sharing and they they say they're curious to know what resources we can help students look for when choosing what school to attend that will provide more support for students of color specifically so if whether this maybe is a parent or an educator, someone who works with students, helping them choose a college, what resources should they be looking for specifically to help students of color? I feel like it depends on who the student is. There are some students who don't mind being immersed into a university where it is predominantly white uh, because they feel like, okay, I'm going to go into this university with my head on straight and get my and keep my act together and do what I have to do. And it's also going to be it's a mirror of what maybe the field that they're going to go into after they graduate college, because there are a lot there are a decent amount of working fields where the staffing and the CEOs and everybody are predominantly white. and you want to know what it's going to be like, especially if you come from a community like Nork, where it is predominantly Black and Latina. 
but there are other students like myself where I really wanted to immerse myself in a diverse uh, university, so, which is one of the many reasons why I chose Rutgers North. Um, and I was a Rutgers Future Scholar, so I've literally been at Rutgers since I was in the seventh grade. <laughs> so yeah, you want to get to know like the type of people that you'll end up working with in the field that you're going to end up working with. Like, I plan on being a clinical social worker, and I'll most likely be working within the state of New Jersey, and I know that I would want to work with uh, students who, students and people who don't have the resources that people in other communities have, and I come from this community, so I want to give back. That's great. Thank you so much. And that's such a great point about making that networking, those human connections uh, that'll set you up for the next stage after college. And, and you guys, I, I, yeah, Rashid, really quickly that I need to introduce someone. From yeah, just really quickly, I think uh, the kind of resources that looking back that I definitely would have looked for. And also I hear this a lot from my peers um, at the Black Student Union, at the Mahante Latina, these are essentially affinity groups at Franklin and Marshall. Um, is the diversity in the faculty department at whatever school you're selecting for your students. So it's just for me, I think, and also just from research that I've read, I think it's almost natural uh, for students who are coming from places like Newark um, to go into a space like Villanova, Franklin and Marshall that are very different from where they come from and naturally gravitates towards people who look like them at first. And so I think Definitely looking at the diverse diversity in the faculty um, of the institution that your uh, students applying for. Another uh, point is uh, financial aid, right? Schools that give a lot of money that have a huge endowment, um, obviously have a uh, set the students up for a long term success, um, not just short term success, which is essentially graduating college, but long term because they've come out of college um, with very little debt. Um, and I think research has also found that students, who, low income students, who come out with a lot of debt. Uh, tend to not be able to purchase homes and uh, do other things that are part of the American dream. So yeah, Great. college and uh, diversity in faculty. Yeah. Thank you so much. All right. Well, I want to thank the panelists so much for such a wonderful conversation. And before we close out, I want to make sure that a representative from Prudential is able to say a few words. We're so grateful for their sponsorship of the event. And I want to introduce Tiffany Jackson, who I know and is a great um, friend of Chalkbeat. She's the manager and inclusive solutions at Prudential Financial. And before joining Prudential, uh, she was the program manager of schools that can new work. So Tiffany, would you like to say a few words? Sure, and I'll, and I'll be really quick. Um, thank you so much for having me. Um, I think it's so important that um, the, the young people that spoke today continue to have their voices kind of raised up. So I just want to really quickly thank um, Camille, Zanaya, Rashid, Devon, and Melanie for, um, for your words today, for sharing the challenges you're facing, your fears, your excitement, your hope. Um, it was wonderful to hear directly from you about how you're navigating um, in this time. And I just wanted to say that I'm going to use your perspective and your words to inform my actions um, as I continue to do the work here in Newark. Um, and then also wanted to give my thanks to Ms. Holder, uh, who I know well and is always so wonderful to see, um, because her perspective, not only as a parent, but a community leader and honestly an expert. Um, when it comes to college access and success for our young people is so crucial. So thank you for lending your voice here today as well. Um, and uh, just quickly, I just wanted to share, you know, Prudential's commitment to Newark and particularly education in Newark spans decades. Um, and so I'm really uh, excited about the support that we give to Newark education, directly to the district, to charter schools, to private schools like St. Benedict's, to Rutgers University, Newark. Um, we really are so dedicated to ensuring um, a high quality education system here in Newark from K all the way through post-secondary. Um, and so we wanted to show that commitment here again um, by, by sponsoring this wonderful event by Chalkbeat. Um, so again, congratulations uh, to Chalkbeat, to Patrick on this capstone for the Ready or Not series, um, which was just excellent reporting as always. Um, and so best of luck to all of the young people uh, on the call today. Um, you are incredibly resilient and I admire your grit. 
Um, and uh, best of luck to you all. And thank you for having me. Thank you thank so you. much, Tiffany. Thank you, everybody here. Thank you, Tiffany. Really appreciate it. Uh, students, I encourage you and Ms. Holder, I encourage you to take a look quickly at the chat before we close out. Lots of accolades and words of encouragement. Um, audience members, we're so grateful you uh, spend this hour with us. Thank you so much for your comments and your great questions. We so wish we could have gotten to all of them, but know that we're going to follow up uh, via email with you all, not only with a recording of this conversation, but also opportunities to keep the conversation going. Um, this conversation isn't going away this semester. It's in, in fact going to be intensified as schools restart, as students talk, uh, live and walk through the challenges that we've talked through. Uh, so know that Chalkbeat Newark is dedicated to re reporting on this and hopefully our reporting will continue to answer your questions and uplift the amazing students that you've heard today and their perspectives. Uh, so please be on the lookout for that email. It'll also include um, a quick poll questionnaire that'll help us make our events better because uh, we'd love to keep doing these student conversations and, and we need your help to do them well. Um, so students, thank you so much again for your time. Uh, we really appreciate it. And we're gonna close out today's conversation. Uh, and thank you all so much. We'll be back in touch soon. Thank you everyone.